Hello and welcome to the live session on inflammatory bowel disease. I'm your host Dr. Fazia and I'm delighted to have with me today Dr. Yogesh Batra, senior consultant gastroenterology and hepatology. Aaj hum baat karenge IBD ke bare mein. Kya hota hai? Kyu ho jata hai? Kya precautions lene chahiye? Kya tips hote hain IBD patients ke liye aur bahut kuch. A very warm welcome to Dr. Yogesh Batra for joining us and talking to us on this topic. Welcome to our live session sir. Thank you Dr. Pazia for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me for the session. Uh so sir let's start. Uh can you just tell us what is inflammatory bowel disease? So inflammatory bowel disease is a type of autoimmune disease oh, what we can speak in Hindi or English? So anything both Okay so inflammatory bowel disease is a type of autoimmune disease. So there are multiple soldiers in the body which are designed to fight infection. So if these soldiers like lymphocytes, polymorphs, they turn against the body itself, and they feel that the the colon or the small intestine is an external organ, and they mount an immune attack against the body's organs, these are known as autoimmune diseases. These autoimmune diseases can be in various parts of the body. and inflammatory bowel disease is the autoimmune disease which is confined to either the small bowel or the large bowel if it is predominantly in the small bowel it is known as crohn's disease although crohn's disease can occur in any part of the bowel from the mouth to the rectum if it is involved only in the large bowel then it is known as ulcerative colitis okay so uh, these are the major differences in uh, crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis If you can just uh, explain to us in slight detail, what are the major differences between these so, two? So basically, it is a matter of nomenclature. The etiopathogenesis of both Crohn's as well as ulcerative colitis remains the same. Mm-hmm. Crohn's affects any part of the body. Ulcerative colitis affects only the colon. Rectum, which is the last part of the large bowel, is almost invariably involved in ulcerative colitis. it might be involved in crohn's it might not be no involved in crohn's crohn's are lesions are skip lesions so they are there in multiple parts while ulcerative colitis the inflammation is continuous involving the entire uh, large bowel ulcerative colitis since it involves the large bowel predominantly presents as bleeding while crohn's presents as pain abdomen and intestinal obstruction ulcerative colitis Uh, is a mucosal inflammation involving only the first layer of the intestine while crohn's disease is a transmural inflammation involving the entire intestine so these basically are the differences but as i said apart from the fact that the presentation varies because of the site of the involvement they are both essentially sisters and they are part of the same spectrum of disease okay um and how 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 does the a, a doctor a diagnose an inflammatory bowel disease if a patient comes to you with a right. condition or so if a patient comes to if a patient comes to us with ulcerative colitis he comes to us with rectal bleeding tenesmus tenesmus is pain during defecation uh if he comes to us with crohn's disease he comes to us with pain abdomen he comes to us with intestinal obstruction presents a distension of abdomen repeated vomiting so you need to have a strong clinical suspicion you need to have a x ray you need to have a ct scan and you have to have a colonoscopy or a endoscopy and if endoscopy does not show up anything then a capsule endoscopy might show so clinical suspicion followed by few basic investigation leads to the confirmation of diagnosis and once we know which area is inflamed we take biopsies to have a final confirmation <clears throat> so the final confirmatory test would be the biopsy uh, during a colonoscopy or an endoscopy is that it for uh, diagnosing ibd correct so final confirmation test for anything is usually a biopsy but in the case of inflammatory bowel disease the biopsy actually only shows inflammation uh, which might be bacterial which might be uh, autoimmune 
so it is a constellation of clinical features along with help by uh, biopsy it is not that you get anything specific in biopsy which tells you that this is indeed ib okay you only get inflammation and there are there any risk factors which increase the likelihood of ibd are there certain sect of a uh, population which is more susceptible to ibd so ibd has a genetic predisposition it is not a direct inheritance so it is not that somebody whose parents are having ibd the child is also going to have ibd but the incidence of ibd is more in those families where the parents have ibd so that is one smokers have a incidence increased incidence of ibd alcohol has a predisposition of developing ibd then uh, those who have a lot of anxiety have a increased predilection to develop ibd and uh, the the present day fast foods and the fast kind of a life is something which has been attributed to development of ibd Okay. Uh, and what are the various treatment modalities once a patient is diagnosed with IBD? I mean, what do you uh, tell him? What are the various treatments? Which, which once the patient is diagnosed with IBD, the first thing to do is uh, we start with dietary counseling. And dietary counseling means that no outside food. The diet which is best suited for IBD is the Mediterranean diet. and by mediterranean diet i mean lots of grains lots of fruits lots of vegetables chicken and fish but not the kind of preparation that we do in india so with minimal oil and minimal masala ala uh, nuts and legumes this is a diet which is ideal for patients of ibd number 2 is a reduction of anxiety for which even if we need to give a small anxiolytic that is fine number 3 is medication so there are a whole lot of medications which are available the age old medication which was there since the 1800s 1900s has been uh, sulfasalazine sulfasalazine comes in various forms there are delayed release preparation which goes and releases only in the large bowel uh it has minimal side effects but can cause nausea can cause vomiting can cause reduction in sperm count can cause low folate levels but overall a drug which is tolerated well if sulfasalazine does not work then the next thing that we go on to are steroids okay steroids can be uh, again the standard hydrocortisone biselone or the newer topical steroid which is known as budesonide after steroids the next thing is immunomodulators so these are drugs which suppress immunity and the predominant drug which we use here is azathioprine following azathioprine there are a lot of new drugs which have come and these new drugs are known as biologics so biologics have been game changers in uh, the management of ibd and they have actually successfully reduced the incidence of surgery to very high levels of 30 40% to almost nil now after biologicals there are another set of molecules known as small molecules which are oral, oral tablets which can also be given for the management of diabetes and finally as is the case in in everything in medicine if everything fails then it is surgery surgery Uh, so uh, what are the various challenges that you face in effectively treating uh, ibd is it is patient no. compliance uh, important uh, absolutely no patient compliance is the biggest challenge so getting patients to understand that this is a lifelong disease and it can only be suppressed and it cannot be cured is the biggest challenge because you can actually only suppress immunity and after some time if you stop the drug the disease comes back so most people tend to think that once the disease has improved uh, there is no need to take medicine so the moment they stop medicine there is a relapse of the disease that is the biggest challenge then adherence to diet is poor because everyone today wants to eat food which tastes good 
because they have been used to that kind of food. So the moment they start eating the diet which has been prescribed, they improve their chances of disease relapses. High. Then side effects of drugs like steroids, like <clears throat> like uh, Azuran, like biologics, can lead to infections, and that can also uh, cause them to turn off the the medication. So essentially, it is something which has to be under continuous supervision. You have to have a set of highly trained individuals. You have to have a complete protocolized management, and you have to have a a complete unit which is managing diabetes in which you have to have a dietitian you have to have a counselor you have to have surgeons and you have to have gastroenterologists we are fortunate that we have such a unit at apollo and we are able to manage our ibt patients uh, completely from the counseling aspect the psychological aspect the diet and if needed surgery uh, we have the entire spectrum of drugs and we are giving subcutaneous biologics in the OPD and intravenous biologics by admitting in the world. Uh, so, sir, as you said that um, uh, having IBT, if a patient has IBT, then it is a lifelong thing. He would be right. having, uh, he would be on treatment uh, continuously for the entire course of his life. Now, uh, this would definitely at some point affect his quality of life. Would it or would it not? So, if there is good compliance to medication, it is today possible to maintain a normal quality of life as normal as a hypertensive or a diabetic who would be taking treatment for diabetes or for hypertension. Similarly, you have to take some medicine or a biologic injection every 15 days or every two months and you are absolutely not. That is the message which I want to convey to this uh, podcast today that IBD is not something in which we need to worry about anymore. It can be treated normally and patients can have a completely normal lifestyle. Yeah, so I think that would be one of the major concerns of uh, people who are suffering with IBD or who have been recently diagnosed with IBD that, uh, I mean, how... uh, our quality of life should not be affected. I think uh, yes. that was very answered, sir. Yeah. The problem has to be managed well, has to be managed adequately, and has to be managed in a sustained manner. Yeah. So you hit hit hard and you then de-escalate. So there are two ways to manage this. One is that earlier it used to be a step up or up approach in which you started trying with the medication and went on escalating it. Now is a step down approach that you straight away start with the injections, the biologics, and then as improvement occurs, you gradually de-escalate. You come down to medication once you have a control of the disease. Okay. Uh, so uh, while you're discussing biologics, these are the latest uh, in the treatment of IBD. Apart from this, are there any other new treatment modalities which has which have come up, which our viewers may be interested in knowing? So, first about biologics. Biologics is something which has come up in India in the last five years, I would say. Infliximab was the first biologic which came. This is an injection which has to be given every two months. This was after the loading dose. This was followed by a dalimumab. This is a subcutaneous injection. And then there was vidulizumab and ustekinumab. So we have at least four biologics which are now available in the country. The last two have come in recently in this year only. Uh, so biologic treatments is becoming safer and safer with the advent of newer molecules and newer uh, uh, newer injections. Apart from injection, there is a drug known as topacetinib, which is a oral drug. And this is also a biologic which is designed for use only for ulcerative colitis. It cannot be given for Crohn's because it does not have efficacy. Okay. So these are biological which are now available, which are being given and uh, which are nothing to be afraid of. Because most most patients, the moment you, you tell them that this is an injection which has to be given every 15 days or every two months, they start thinking that this is a chemotherapy. 
so these are safe medicines they do have they have a risk of infection they do carry a risk of development of things like lymphoma but if monitored well and uh, monitored in a in a normal regular manner then there should not be any problem with any of these so following allergics the next thing is uh, probiotics various kinds of probiotics are now available uh, one of the probiotics is vsl3 which has been used for a long time and uh, is is the standardized treatment for ibd fecal microbiota transplant is another thing <clears throat> which means that you replace the gut microbiome the intestinal bacterial flora you replace by giving either the patient's own uh, fecal micro um, microbiome or somebody else's after sterilizing it so this can be given through colonoscopy or what is predicted is very soon you will have pellets uh, which can be simply swallowed and they will be released in the intestine so once these pellets come in it would become very very simple to change the gut microflora the other thing which is experimental which is used extensively in japan is apheresis apheresis means that you remove the inflammation causing cells the lymphocytes the plasma cells and you reinfuse the blood bag so it's something like dialysis you are simply removing the inflammatory cells so once you remove the inflammatory cells the inflammation comes out there are a host of other experimental things like stem cell transplants all these are are being tried and gradually some of them will see the light of the day uh, since ibd is a big problem in the west and it is coming up like crazy in our country also these things are going to develop uh, at a much faster rate than previously thought yeah so that this brings me to my next uh, question or rather query since we have talked about all these medications what are the potential complications uh, of these medical medications since they would be continued for a long time so every medication has some risk of complications yeah so if we look at the complications of uh, the five asa or the sulfasalazine Sulfasalazine is available in two forms. One is topical. Topical form is a pellet for insertion or a suppository. It is available as a foam or as an enema. So apart from local injury, there is no other complication here. If you take it orally, then it can result uh, in nausea, vomiting, <laughs> bloating. It can cause decrease in folate levels. So it can cause anemia. and it can cause a low sperm the next thing is the immunomodulators so all immunomodulators have similar complications because they all reduce immunity and once they reduce immunity it results in a predisposition to infections apart from the predisposition to infections long term use predisposes them for cancer hence monitoring these patients is very very necessary similarly biologics so the the first and the most effective biologic to date is infliximab but since it is powerful the complications are also more uh, it can lead to again a uh, uh, risk of infections it can cause a reactivation of latent tuberculosis can cause reactivation of hepatitis b and c it can result in lymphoma it can result in a lupus like syndrome so coming back to the same point that all these things have to be given under proper supervision like for biologics we go to the extent of doing the chest ct scan to see that there is no tuberculosis lurking inside before we start any one on biologics so long term use of any of these medication can result in complication but if you look at the risk of complication and you look at the potential risk of of benefit and cure the risk of benefit far over this the risk of the complications so i would not uh, suggest that we do not use the drug because of the low risk of complications it is simply that we have to be aware of the complications and we have to monitor the patients so that they don't land up in complications and if they do 
the complication should be picked up early and treated early. Yeah. So, what will you advise the patients uh, for the self care and how to manage the symptoms? So, those <coughs> with IBD should first of all not hesitate to get investigated. Yes, that's the biggest very problem. Good. The biggest problem in India is that they keep bleeding and and they keep thinking that the blood is because of hemorrhoids to the extent that. Uh, even while surgery is done and uh, yet uh, there is no relief to date the the period from which the patient has symptoms to which he lands up to a specialist is about 2 to 3 years in India okay. so this needs to be cut down and the moment they become symptomatic they should be investigated because the disease once it is picked up early can be managed much better and much faster. So that is the first thing. Second is that investigations are not harmful and they can be they can be done with ease. They do not cause any discomfort at all. Uh, colonoscopy can be done under anesthesia, so it is not something that one should be afraid of. Once the diagnosis is made, then there is, I mean, to make a diagnosis also, there has to be a lot of awareness. This awareness is lacking in our peripheral cities and towns because people are still in that mode that IBT does not exist in India. So that realization has to come and that would come through these kind of talks and, and dissemination of information by doctors from the, the major cities. Uh, the next problem is that treatment. Treatment is usually started late and once it is started, it is usually not adequate because even the treating people are afraid of, of complications. Then uh, there is a, a patient reluctance to continue treatment. So once treatment is started, these patients have to be kept on follow-up. It is our responsibility that we call them and we make sure that proper treatment is actually being is, is, uh, is being carried out. So you have to have IBD clinics where a proper recall for these patients is done uh, and make sure that they are receiving like something like what is being done for dots. So if the proper treatment continues, then there is no reason that there would be any problem with the quality of life or for that matter any problem with their longevity they can have a normal life they can become pregnant i mean nothing changes in them so basically awareness along with uh, we would uh, i think welcome uh, any program which is initiated by the government on a national scale so that, uh, the awareness is spread down right to the grassroots levels about ibd the same as it has been done about tuberculosis. I think that is what you meant to say. Absolutely. Absolutely. But uh, so far, the perception is that IBD is a disease of the, of the rich. So it is not on the government's agenda. But the rich also, in a, in a population of 1.4 billion, the rich are also becoming rich very, very fast. So the numbers are actually increasing tremendously. And the numbers of IBD today in India are probably more than the number in the westernized worlds like US or Canada. So it's a huge problem. It's not something which, which can be brushed under the carpet. So it does need a program. And till that program comes up, the private sector has to pitch in and it has to have the dissemination of knowledge and run these clinics and have patients treated properly. Right, sir. Um, so, uh, like for individuals with cancer, we have a cancer support uh, kind of an organization. So, for IBD, do we have such kind of organizations which help support the individuals and enlighten them or, you know, uh, help them, uh, uh, support them uh, during the entire course of the treatment? Do we have something so far, like that? No, so far we do not have. Uh, subsidized treatment is being provided by tertiary care government hospitals where the companies are giving the biologics at subsidized rates or for free but uh, the majority do not have access to this kind of treatment 
Uh, so, sir, uh, one last question. What would be your takeaway for IBD patients? What would you like to tell them in just one sentence? Do not be afraid of the disease. Get treated early and get treated adequately. Your lifestyle is not going to change and you will have a normal. That's summed up absolutely beautifully. Sir, thank you so much for discussing and giving us this vital information about IGT. It was a pleasure talking to you, sir. And thank it was a wonderful so enlightening thank session. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again. We are also streaming this out as a podcast as Hello Apollo on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, etc. Thank you to your viewers and listeners for tuning in and making uh, our sh show grow in such large numbers. उम्मीद है आपको ये सेशन पसंद आया होगा होपिंग टू सी यू अगेन वेरी सुन विद अ फ्रेश न्यू टॉपिक टिल देन टेक केयर बी हेल्दी एंड स्टे सेफ